multiple hypothesis testing. Last lecture discussed inferences for single population parameters. However, in most molecular biology experiments of today, uh, we are making multiple readouts per sample. For instance, in an RNA-seq experiment, you will get one readout per transcript of uh, each patient. Similarly, in a proteomics experiment, you will get a readout per protein. These are not just single events anymore, there are multiple readouts. And hence, we need to uh, do multiple hypothesis uh, tests per, uh, per sample. And um, this uh, introduces a couple of problems that we will discuss in this lecture. The main problem is that we use p-values to reject null models. And um, this um, is okay when we just do one single test. However, we are in when we do multiple tests, we are repeatedly asking the null model for, for advice. This introduces multiple testing problems, and we will use the next rest of the lecture to discuss these and how to correct for them. Let's try an example here. So. Say, for instance, that you measure thousand different transcripts for each patient, and you will try to find which are differential. And um, after doing, uh, say, a t-test on, on, on uh, between the case and control here, you use a p-value threshold of five percent. Uh, that would mean that under null model, you would only expect um, uh, five percent of the findings to be above this threshold. However, if you did 1,000 uh, experiments, that's those 5% is actually a quite um, big number, 20 different readouts. Um, so you would expect 20 readouts just to be above this threshold just by pure chance. This is an effect you have to compensate for. This is a little bit uh, like this t-shirt test here. If you think you're one in a million, there are 6,000 other people exactly like you. This is interesting as a joke, as um, actually it, we compare something that seems uh, at first very unlikely, uh, namely that you're one in a million with a very large number, like uh, six, million people, uh, 6 billion people in the universe. Uh, that means that you are actually having all of a sudden quite, quite a number of chances to be uh, uh, to fulfill this thing one in a million. And the same thing it goes with, with, um, uh, with p-values. Just to, uh, uh, an example that I took from, from nature, um, it's a microarray study in, in mice. I won't name any authors of this, but the authors were, were looking at um, some differential gene expression and they found 77 and 642 and 2,482 um, different expression genes at, at, at different p-value thresholds. What does that really mean? Well, actually, if you uh, would st study 50,000 probes, and um, there's actually, and you assume that there's actually no really measurement effect going on, so you measure all these 15,000 probes. How many would you be? Um, uh, so, so they all these probes are, are under null hypothesis. How many of them would we expect by to be significant? Just by definition, a p-value threshold of five percent would mean that we, we would just multiply the fifty thousand probes with with five uh, percent, and that's the number of um, uh, null hypothesis we, we will uh, assume would just from definition be reported. So this will give us fifty five hundred two thousand five hundred different differently expressed null hypothesis. So actually the reported number of genes are pretty um, uh, coming in line here with with the number of uh, differentially expressed probes you expected by chance. So we need a way to correct for this. And the remedy for this is, is known as um, a false discovery rate. To illustrate this, let's consider a thought experiment here. So say that we have a um, uh, have throughput experiment that generated a large set of readouts. Uh, some of them are generated 
as negatives and others as positives. Uh, so positives would typically be adhering to, to the alternative hypothesis when the negatives from the null hypothesis. Uh, let's not consider that for now, but just say even as positives and negatives. Uh, you, they are as well associated with the score and you made histograms of these and somebody has magically told you which one are the positive and which are the negative findings. Uh, you would like to design a threshold for this data so you say that you react all the data below this score threshold and accept everything above it and uh, uh, at that point you could of course use a uh, p-value threshold and a p-value threshold that would be uh, the equivalent of just taking a negative distribution here and see what fraction of this um, uh, distribution are above the score threshold uh, compared to the whole distribution of negatives. That's roughly what we call a p-value. Um, when you calculate the full scale rate instead you take everything above the score threshold both the positive and negative findings and uh, you sort of take uh, that in relationship to, to the negatives above the score threshold. So you take the red area above the threshold and divide that by all the findings above the threshold. That's known as the full scale rate. And the reason why we care about the full scale rate is that we typically in a, um, an experiment, a half robot experiment, we report not just uh, or not every uh, finding but we report the findings that are above a certain th threshold it wouldn't make sense to write a, um, a manuscript about uh, all the findings you made in the high throughput experiment including the junk you have in the, in the bottom of the, of the few findings you want to report the things that you think are correct and the question is just with what um, certainty do you want to do so and then the false scale rate plays in hand because it's really reports the, it really tells you something about the things you want to report. So how can we calculate the full scale rate? Well, let's start with looking at this as from a perspective of p-values instead. So if we have a set of p-values that we've reported for different probes, um, uh, each of the, these probes coming with an ID and a p-value. We understand that the lower the p-value is, uh, the more likely the, uh, the p-value is stemming from, from the alternative hypothesis. And the lower or the higher the p-value, uh, the, the more likely it, it stems from null hypothesis. So we could put a threshold on in this list and say that everything above this threshold we deem that significant and everything below the threshold as non-significant. So all the probes above the threshold significant, everything below non-significant. Another terminology that you often see is that um, uh, above threshold we got our true positives uh, and uh, we got our false positives. And below the, the threshold we got our false negatives and true negatives. So anything below threshold are negative um, uh, negative uh, calls and everything about threshold is positive calls and there's like false and, and uh, true ones of those. So the true positives being uh, adhering to, to the alternative hypothesis and the false positives to, to the null hypothesis. So uh, another way to, to illustrate this would be that we have um, if we make a histogram out of after all our p-values, they would now either adhere to the null hypothesis and, and or the alternative hypothesis. The, the null hypothesis being on, uh, uh, by definition, being evenly distributed over the, um, the scale between zero and one. Uh, but it's the alternative hypothesis are more rich towards the uh, lower end. So we have lower, with lower p-value, you're more likely to adhere to, to the alternative hypothesis. So um, if we now would know uh, which ones were the alternative hypothesis and which were null hypothesis, we can easily calculate something known as the full scale rate. And that's, that's the expected value of the fraction of tests below the threshold X that are generated on null hypothesis. Um, 
so in our case now we have a p-value score of, um, of a certain value and above this threshold that we put on this we can see that that two of the the hypothesis were, were on the non hypothesis and and uh, was in total 10 different ones um, about or, or below this threshold that means that we got two out of ten incorrect meaning that we have a false scale rate of 20 percent in practice we never know which ones which are are um, actual null hypothesis and which are, done, are alternative ones which which statistics generated which this is just a statistical argument so um, instead we have a we need to have a way to estimate the fraction of uh, a hypothesis that are, are incorrect this could be be calculated now um, uh, by procedure given in this paper that um, you will find a component links to Statistical Significance in Genome-Wise Studies by, by Ion Story and Ron, Rob Tipshirani. Um, and this is a sort of an idea where, where, where we try to, uh, or the, um, uh, the authors try to um, control for, for what's known as a false scale rate, namely the number of false positive features divided by the n uh, number of significant features. And this is something that they taken from uh, Benjamin Hochberg since 1995. Say that we have a stream of p values from p1 to pm. It, it will be uh, desirable to be able to tell now, uh, build up a function f of t here, which is the number of null statistics um, below a certain tre threshold t. Similarly, it, we actually quite easily can make um, uh, a function s of t uh, that reports the number of p-values below a t-value, regardless of their, if they belong to the null or alternative hypothesis. So this is actually very easy to make. It's just to, to count the number of uh, p-values below a certain threshold. If we would have those two functions, we can calculate the expected value of the fraction of them, namely the false cover rate. So the invention here of the paper is that the, the authors realized that you can calculate um, uh, the, the number of p-values f of t as a function of uh, just the threshold you select, because um, the p-values are supposed to be even, by, just by definition, p-values are, are evenly distributed on a null hypothesis. So if you know how many um, uh, p-values that belongs to the null uh, m0, then you would be able to, as well to, to, to put a threshold on this and say that every uh, m0t, that's the number of, of p-values that you will see at a certain threshold. In practice, we seldom know this number, so we instead have to um, take the total number of null hypothesis m times t and then multiply this with a prior probability of belonging to null hypothesis. So it becomes pi zero mt. And a little later on, we'll learn how to estimate this pi zero. So a false scale rate is simply um, the number of or the estimation of the, the pi zero, the prior probability, times the number of p-values times the thresholds, divided by the number of p-values you, you see uh, uh, below a certain threshold. And that's just as easy as that. So here's a little bit more graphical ex explanation of, of the same thing or, or illustration of the same thing. So if you have your p-value histogram, um, you can look on all the hypotheses below a certain threshold t. Um, these either adhere to, to the null hypothesis or they don't. Or they, and if we can then just sort of um, estimate which fraction of, of, uh, of this that belongs to, to the null, uh, this red area here, which is even distributed over histogram, then you will, will sort of know just by the right of the box what full scope rate we are at. So how do we estimate this thing with pi zero? Well, actually this can be easily estimated as well since we know that the null, null um, the p-values are evenly distributed on, on the null. 
So if we, we look on, on how do, do, do the null values come out, um, we see that they're, they're um, uh, the less of less of them, the higher up in p-value we, we, we walk. So if we start on, on a low um, p-value on the x-axis here, the, this is a p-value versus a frequency plot. If we start at a low p-value, we see less, uh, or we see, see quite a number of alternative hypotheses, but the further out to, towards the end of this distribution, the less we see. So we can make now, um, in the storage of Shirani paper, they make the, the uh, estimations here based on, on what, if these, uh, all the statistics were evenly distributed, they would be distributed according to M1 minus uh, and the threshold lambda for, for any um, particular place we look at. Um, however, if we see a different distribution, that must be due to the fact that we, we have an uneven distribution and, and that there's uh, alternative hypothesis uh, involved as well. But the um, uh, the higher uh, value we select for lambda, the closer to one we get, the the less we, we get less influence from from the, the from this alternative hypothesis. So uh, if we will no get closer and closer estimates of the actual by zero. In the paper, they show this by, by looking at um, uh, the fraction of pi or, or the, the pi zero as an estimate as a function of lambda. And as they, they see, uh, they, the higher the lambda they select, the more um, uh, the more uh, variance they observe. And that's just got to do with, with the sample size here. The, uh, the more um, this, these sort of smaller this, the data sizes are, the more variance you introduce in it as well. So the, the idea is to find uh, in this curve, where is the point where, where you could, um, uh, the variance start to, to, to increase too much and where we can uh, let, trust it so where, where, where we, but that we still can trust it. So we could uh, look for, for, in this case, maybe somewhere around 0.6, this seems to break down in this case. And um, so now the, the idea is then, then you, uh, the authors just fit um, a cubic spline to this, this um, uh, op to this distribution and they look on where does this uh, this cubic spline now hit the 1.0 of lambda that's the the, the estimate that used for for est estimation furthermore to go on to um, define what you call a Q value and this is a way to make an um, to assure that, that each individual measurement can get a full scale rate of its own. Um, and this is, is a particular problem when we want to build up thresholds for, because um, uh, often we, we want to, to make an individual threshold that's monotonically increasing with, uh, or, or that's increasing with, with the score. And um, so hence they, they make the definition that they, they use uh, the Q value as being any false, any threshold um, that includes the current P value um, or any set, the full scale rate of any set that includes the current P value. Um, so it's actually, if you think about it, you could sort of make, um, in this fictitious example here, we have a problem with the distribution of the false scale rate as a function of a score up here. So you see that with uh, the increased score, you do not see a monotonically monotonical decrease of the false scale rate. Instead, you see it a jaggered behavior. So the, the false scale rate is jumping up and down. Um, if we now apply a Q-value Q calculation on this on top of this, namely that we define 
the Q as the minimal full scale rate to include in the current uh, point, then we will see that we, we sort of uh, saw off this this um, uh, saw or, or this different uh, uh, peaks that are appears in, in, in this data. So we get a, a monotonically decreasing uh, function with, with, with the score. Okay, uh, what I try to tell you here is that if we make uh, estimations based on, on um, uh, a population or on not just one variable but multiple different variables, we need better measurements. And um, the way we do so is often by, by calculating full scale rates and, and uh, uh, Q values. And these are measures that are, are sort of. Um, correcting for the fact that you, you're looking on multiple different things. So a full scale rate is just a fraction of um, uh, number of null hypotheses you see, you, you expect above the threshold. And um, so typically you could see something like, well, I report a thousand genes on, on this threshold uh, and I do so with a full scale rate of 5%, meaning that I expect uh, 50 of those thousand genes to be incorrectly assessed. Uh, 